Most of the time it goes through the medium, but sometimes it can either drift out of the laser beam and become kind of dark, or it can, for example, make a black body induced transition to a different Rydberg state, where the atom is still in Rydberg state, it still interacts with the other atoms, but it actually, um, but, but it's dark, right? And so, and this is, you know, these processes occur at random, and they basically cause fluctuations in the amplitude of transmitted light. And basically, you know, uh, by looking at G2 and looking at where it goes down to 1, you sort of can estimate the, the time scale of this process. And actually, this time scale is some, you know, tens of microseconds, actually consistent with this, both of these kind of mechanisms. And we actually sort of verified it also in different uh, uh, experiments. So that's, we believe, is the reason why this is the case. Uh, but this is a kind of a technical issue. I mean, this issue of this very broad, correlation length is actually kind of a fundamental issue because it's not quite consistent with our expectation of, of the blockade, Rydberg blockade, playing the key role. So we need to understand it. So uh, and just sort of another kind of um, <coughs> direct information of that is that what we can do, we can basically look at the input-output relation. So, so we can, for example, change the incoming uh, the rate of the incoming photons, and you know, for weak, uh, 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 for weak um, uh, um, uh, field, input field, uh, so basically the input-output is essentially a linear relationship, so that's kind of not obvious on this curve maybe, because but, you know, now it's, it's linear, uh, but then um, at around sort of one photon per microsecond, uh, this curve saturates, and uh, basically, uh, uh, what we can do now is we can kind of, you know, um, look at this value of, this, you know, of the saturation rates. So basically, look at how many photons, what's the photon rate which comes out of the uh, of the cloud. And actually, if you take this photon rate and multiply this correlation length, then what you really see is that basically this that this number only depends on the ratio of the blockade radius. Uh, divided by the transverse uh, width of the beam. So it almost doesn't depend on anything else except for the ratio of the blockade radius, the size of our macroatom, to the transverse diameter of the beam. And so basically, when this uh, blockade radius exceeds the transverse diameter, then this kind of, uh, this quantity kind of saturates and it saturates at sort of a fraction of a photon per correlation length. So what does it tell us? Remember this picture of, oh, sorry, this, so this is supposed to be a laser beam, which is not so. But remember this picture of, of, of atoms as a kind of, as a walls, which try to block the propagation of the flow of light in the pipe, right? So I said that when the effective size of the atom becomes larger than the, local, than the focusing, then it's basically, then it you know becomes extremely nonlinear. You know, one atom blocks the pipe. So it's exactly what happens here. So when the size of macroatom becomes larger than the uh, this uh, kind of you know diameter of the focus beam, uh, then basically what comes out at the end is uh, the photon flux, which corresponds to a number which is less than sort of you know one photon per cloud. So the, basically what it tells us is that two photons cannot coexist in the entire cloud of atoms. So these are kind of experimental results. Now let me talk a little bit about how one can understand these results. Are there any questions? Okay, so in order to understand this result, what we need to do, we need to kind of look at the evolution of the uh, probability amplitude, which corresponds to basically, you know, uh, uh, you know, two photons being inside the cloud. So this, this quantity psi is essentially is a kind of a two photon wave function, right? It basically describes uh, uh, the probability amplitude of one photon being in position Z1, Z2, in general, it's also a function of time. But we will, look, we will be looking at a steady state, so we'll not worry about this time. And what one can do is actually, kind of starting from the first principles, derive <coughs> equation of motion 
for this probability amplitude. So it's kind of like a two photon wave function, basically. Um, and this um, uh, uh, probability amplitude has four terms. So when, you know, if you sort of get rid of time, then it has you know, uh, one term, which is basically proportional to the center of mass motion. So R is kind of a, uh, essentially a position uh, of the center of mass uh, of this kind of two photons, Z1 plus Z2 uh, over 2 in the cloud. So this is like a propagation distance, if you want. So then, of course, there is a term which corresponds to two photon interaction. And then there is actually another term which, actually, which corresponds, which is effective mass term, which is proportional to the kind of second order derivative of relative position of two photons. So where do these all terms come from? Right? So this first term comes from this kind of Rydberg Rydberg interaction. So it corresponds to uh, interaction between these two, and this corresponds to some kind of complex potential. So this is sort of what we expect. But then there is a second term. And so this second term is actually somewhat subtle. So it kind of corresponds to the uh, um, kind of effective complex mass of these photons. And it actually emerges due to the EIT bandwidth. Remember when we talked about this adiabaticity, I, I mentioned to you that one key feature of the EIT is that it has a finite bandwidth. So this finite bandwidth uh, basically uh, uh, corresponds to the kind of uh, uh, to, to the losses, you know, for the fields which have, you know, kind of frequency components which are away from the two photon resonance. So in fact, this is precisely the kind of you know physics which results in this effective mass. So but basically, you know, in this, in this kind of theoretical framework. Uh, uh, this, uh, you can think about this propagation of, of photon pairs as a kind of, you know, strongly interactive gas of massive photons. So this mass comes from dispersion, and the interactions come from the Rydberg, uh, uh, Rydberg interactions. So let me kind of now just, you know, kind of step back a little bit and give you a little bit of intuition about what is this interaction potential between these two. Uh, atoms. So basically, to understand uh, where it comes from, we can just think about some simple picture. Essentially, suppose that you have one polariton, you know, which is atom-like, where you know the excitation is in a Rydberg state, and suppose another one is approaching it. So what will be the interaction potential? Right. The way to understand it is to remember this kind of susceptibility, which we did, which I have written down for you for EIT, and basically what will happen is that. So in this case, the interaction is essentially proportional to the phase shift that the second photon experiences, right? And it's, you know, and basically this phase shift is due to the fact that this level, uh, the Rydberg state for the second polariton, depends on the distance from the first polariton, right? This is basically a refractive index which depends on the distance between two photons or two polaritons. Right? And that's what the kind of, that's the kind of stuff which uh, basically comes in here. And uh, in fact, what you can do for the case when you, when both, when all of these fields are initially at resonance, so this, uh, uh, this potential, interaction potential is mostly imaginary, corresponding to two photon absorption. And for large distances, it decays as one over six. But then what happens is these two photons approach each other when the dipole dipole shift becomes sufficiently large, right? Then you basically can forget about the IT. It's kind of like an asymptotic freedom. So when the two photons come close together, there is no EIT, right? They just kind of move as free photons, right? And then what happens is that they kind of experience uh, absorption in this case, much like, you know, free photons would experience without the IT. Note that the shape of this potential is very much reminiscent to the kind of shapes that you've seen yesterday, for example, in the talks involving uh, Rydberg dressing, right? So it's a kind of the same physics which, which, uh, which uh, takes, similar physics which takes place. So, okay, so now if we put this all together, so then, like at resonance, you know, you have imaginary mass and you have imaginary interaction potential. So we have sort of like something like a diffusion equation. And 
uh, so then you can basically plot the evolution uh, of the uh, two photon probability and the two atom probability. Z1 and Z2 are basically these you know, positions essentially of two excitations, right, in this case. And so let's try to understand now what happens if the photons come into the medium. So the first thing is that, you know, you still you have a little bit of, you know, uh, kind of uh, photon amplitude, which is sort of now for the coherent state, is basically, you know, equally distributed uh, here. But, uh, but you cannot excite two atoms. And so when, when Z1, Z, Z1 is equal to Z2, then the two atom excitation <coughs> probability is basically zero right, due to the blockade. Right? And so this is an blockade radius. But then what happens is that, and so as a result, what happens is that the, the two photon probability for Z1 is equal to Z2 is very rapidly attenuated. Right? But then uh, these two photons keep propagating together. And they have this kind of imaginary mass, which tends to basically spread this correlation. Right? So what this imaginary mass does, you know, basically, you know, this initial correlation, the initial hole in this two photon probability tends to spread out. So and that's how these correlations basically get distributed over the entire cloud. So the Rydberg blockade causes two photon loss, and then uh, this correlation Length grows as inverse EIT bandwidth, right? So basically, what you do, you create a kind of a, a, a special structure if you want in the position, but this structure uh, has a high frequency component, right? And these frequency components are being absorbed due to the EIT, due to a finite bandwidth of the EIT medium, and that's how this kind of structure becomes uh, more and more spread. Right? And so, of course, these two, two processes compete, and actually it turns out that this two photon loss exceeds diffusion if what dB is larger than one. And so this is basically this kind of, this two photon probability is exactly the stuff which we observe in this photon correlation measurements. So that's the story of the, of the, of the resonant, of, of the photon interaction in the resonant EIT. Right, so as a result of that, this medium, uh, you know, uh, uh, results in the so-called photon blocking. So it says in this medium, photons can go through only one at a time, right? The photon pairs uh, get absorbed. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, one question about this two photon <coughs> probability distribution. Yeah. Uh, at really small separations, it shows that they can exist. Together. That's right, because this is, these, are the, these are the distances smaller than absorption length. Smaller than absorption length. So you come out, you come in, and you know, if the medium is thin, it does not have a chance to do anything with, mm -hmm. with, with So photons. the medium doesn't even interact with photons? They exactly, or not enough. Okay. Right, not enough. That makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, could you explain what did you mean by when two photons get too close, there's no EIT? So what I mean exactly is this. So, so suppose you have suppose you have a situation. Uh, so let's consider like um, consider a situation of two for two excitations approach each other, and suppose that. Like one of them, let's kind of, of course, then you have symmetrizing, but suppose one of uh, them is, uh, uh, is a slow polyton, which is mostly atomic. Okay? Then let's look at the other one. So when the other one approaches, and so this is, let's say, Z1, when the other one approaches it, uh, what happens is that this state, the, uh, the Rydberg state for the second polyton, experiences a shift, right? And what this shift does, it kind of moves this state, this state R2, if you want, at the position Z2, it moves it out of the two photon resonance. Right? And it destroys the EIT. So basically at the end, when the shift is sufficiently large for this photon, you can forget about this coupling. So this photon starts traveling with the kind of velocity, which is no longer slow, 
but it also is absorbed by current. Right. Right. So that's what that's what happens. So yeah, what is what's our time? You know, I I didn't check where you stopped. Oh, so but I'm still here on five ten minutes. Ten, okay, good. So let me at least finish a Lindbergh story kind of quickly and the bonus maybe has to wait for next year. Okay, so uh, the question that I would like to now ask is, um, can we create kind of real photon inter uh, photon photon interaction? And basically, what I mean by that is that, so at this point, you know, <coughs> talk to you about interactions, which was sort of two photon absorption. The real <coughs> interactions of real, for example, atoms in space, you know, they are described by a Hamiltonian. Right? These are the interactions which result in forces, attractive or repulsive. You know, in this case, it's really you know, that's what we know from conventional particles. Right? So these real photon-photon interactions are required, for example, if you want to do something like that, make a lightsaber, for example, if you want to really photons push each other in a way which sort of, you know, will be, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, very reminiscent to what you see in, in the movies. And so uh, following uh, Pierre's suggestion, so this is the research team which undertook this this project, and you know, we can sort of this is you know, this is you here, you know, this is author, this is Adam, and this is Steve. So, but okay, so, but you know, seriously, this kind of you know, coherent interactions are important, for example, for applications in quantum information science. Uh, and you know, for this reason, it's worthwhile exploring them. So, and <coughs> the idea is very simple. So, up to now, we looked at AIT at resonance. Meaning that this probe field and control field were tuned each to the point of a single photon resonance. Uh, so if I would like to uh, switch from absorptive to dispersive effects, what I need to do, I just need to detune these fields away from resonance. And I will detune them in some specific way, such that I will maintain these two photon transitions so that I can still create this, excite these Lindbergh polaritons, but you know, I will tune them away from resonance here, such that basically uh, the dominant effect will be a phase shift, phase shifts rather than absorption. And so here is the actual operating point at which we have done uh, our experiment. So, so this is now the uh, single photon absorption, the medium is optically dense here. So instead of working here, we will now work on the side of the resonance. So as a matter of fact, you know, we will pick uh, here at this point, and what these two curves show, so this uh, red curve is like a two-level medium, and uh, the blue curve is a medium where I apply the control field. Note that when uh, the control field is applied, what happens is that absorption at this point almost practically does not change. Right? The absorption remains the same. <coughs> this is a new feature, but at this point, the absorption is, you know, is, is, is the same. But what changes is the phase shift, right? So this is really uh, the, the key effect here. So basically by going away from resonance, I can create the conditions such that, uh, you know, absorption does not change a lot and the medium is still reasonably transparent, but uh, there is a big phase shift associated with the IT versus non EIT conditions. And now, what I can do, I can just take the logic which I sort of uh, presented before uh, for a resonant case and extend it for off-resonant case. So the idea is the following. So basically, depending of how, of how close two polaritons are from each other, I will either have EIT for both of them, if they are far away, so in this case the phase shift or the effective potential will be zero, or if they are too very close and AIT will be destroyed, and basically, you know, I will have some phase shift for the photons, right? For the photons which are sitting on top to each other, you know, there will be some phase shift. But that's the idea. So, as a matter of fact, in this case, uh, uh, okay, so in this case, what we hope, yeah? I have a question to the previous plot. Yeah. <coughs> so, in the absorption, where exactly is the two-photon resonance? Is it on 
like the crossover between the two level system and the... Well, the it's actually, okay, so that's a very, very good question. So as a matter of fact, the two fourth resonance for this case uh, <coughs> turns out to be exactly at this point where these two cross, these things cross. And actually, if you uh, think now, go back to the ideal EIT system, this is not the point where it, it should have been, right? So basically, uh, for ideal EIT system, a two photon resonance, you should have perfect absorption, uh, perfect transparency right here, right? But what happens is that, you know, in our case, there, this EIT is not perfect because there is a little bit of dephasing. So that kind of changes a little bit uh, the, this kind of transparency. Just, you know, then transparency occurs a little bit away from two photon resonance. It's basically due to, and then the play of EIT and AC Stark shift, right? So basically, in the ideal EIT, there is no AC Stark shift. Right, because there, you know, the atom is decoupled, there is no shift. Right, but if it is not ideal, that's when this, so it's a kind of interesting point. Right? So ideally, of course, you'd like to operate further away from resonance, where the trans there, there will be no losses at all, right? And then it's, these two points will be essentially like kind of identical, right? but, you know, for, because once you have finite, but that will require high optical depth, so for limited optical depth, that's a sort of a compromise. So we have a reasonably transparent medium, but we have a, we have a huge phase shift here. Yeah. Okay, so now how do we measure this phase shift? So in order to measure the phase shift, you of course have to build an interferometer. And the way uh, how we build this interferometer uh, is basically by using polarization of light. So we have um, uh, uh, the situation that I've talked about so far involves basically circular polarized light which excited the, uh, the, uh, the atom. Um, uh, basically, you know, prepared to this kind of stretch state, you know, and then, you know, by the, uh, with a blue light of opposite polarization, we'll just excite certain Rydberg sublet. But what we can do now, we can, instead of using circularly polarized light, we can send in linearly polarized light, which can be decomposed on the sigma plus component and sigma minus component. And what happens is due to the combination of, you know, basically, uh, um, uh, magnetic field and also matrix element for the sigma plus component essentially uh, propagates through this medium with very little uh, uh, with very little change. Right? So the sigma minus component here will kind of serve as a reference for us to measure the relative phase shift between sigma plus and sigma minus. Right? So basically, you measure a phase shift between sigma plus and sigma minus by, by looking how the polarization rotates. Right? It's a kind of it's a polarization interferometer. And uh, uh, of course, then what we need to do is we need to basically you know, analyze this polarization. This is done with the uh, uh, um, a sequence of two wave plates. And uh, then in addition, we have basically a polarizing beam splitter after which we can make this kind of photon correlation measurement. So the kind of novelty of this measurement scheme is that it combines the polarization uh, kind of interferometry with these coincidence measurements. Coincidence measurements is what we need to really, you know, look at quantum effects, at the effects of photons traveling simultaneously or not. Yes? Um, so the sigma minus component is not traveling under the two conditions, is that right? It is not traveling under the conditions, but remember we have this detuning here. Right, so it's basically, it's very, it's absorbed very little, and it has matrix elements, which is like 10 times, 15 times smaller than this one. I was just wondering if the two um, um, polarization components are traveling under different group velocities. Yeah, and they do travel, it's in fact, indeed the case, and you know, there is a consequence of that. The consequence of that, basically, so if we had a perfectly stable laser, this wouldn't matter, but our laser, you know, has some fluctuations, and basically the group delay, uh, in combination, the group delay difference in combination with fluctuation results in dephasing. And we will see, we actually see, we'll see a consequence of that uh, shortly. Any other questions? Okay, so let's now uh, go back. So this, you know, using this method, which I will try before, what one can do, one could here calculate the effective potential uh, of photon-photon interactions as a function of the photon separation. So, in this case, I think, so this is sort of close to the 
experimental conditions or uh, basically in this case, you know, most of the potential comes from this real part of uh, susceptibility. So this most is a conservative potential, right? There's a little bit of two photon absorption, but it's a small effect co combined with this. So in this case, you know, as expected, we immediately can measure a conditional phase. Right? So basically, what this plot tells us is the, so this is a measured phase. So if the two photons are sitting on the top of each other, they pick up the phase. Right? And they pick up the quite substantial phase, you know, exceeding uh, pi over 4. Right? So this is a phase which uh, is accumulated only if I send two photons and they travel together. <coughs> These two photons are not traveling together uh, if they are separated by some distance, as you know, if they emerge, for example, from the um, atomic cloud separated by some certain time delay, right, this phase basically goes to zero, as it should. So this is an example of the measurement of conditional phase. Uh, okay, now this is once again is something which were which we expected. Uh, but of course there is some uh, subtlety here. So if you have a situation, if you have two particles, uh, if you have two particles uh, where the phase uh, depends uh, on the separation, what does that imply? The phase shift is not homogeneous. Yeah. If you have a gradient of phase for a particle, what does it mean for material massive particle? Well, it's the same as basically gradient of potential, right? If you have a gradient, you have a force, right? So the fact is that since we have now a gradient of phase or gradient of a potential, this should basically result in conservative force between the photons. And in this case, in fact, this force is attractive. Right, so if you have two photons which travel with an attractive force, what would you expect to see? That the probability of having two photons at the would same increase. Time. Yes. Exactly. So, and indeed, this is precisely what we observe. Right? So what we observe is that if we change the tuning from uh, from zero to uh, value larger than gamma, then the anti-bunching turns into bunching. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and as, as, a matter, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this bunching has a kind of, you know, very interesting, this kind of cusp type shape beh behavior. So basically, so let me kind of ask now the, the, the kind of, let's try to develop this analogy a little bit more. And, uh, Let's uh, consider the following question. So what if you have two particles, which, for example, uh, in one dimension, right, which have an attractive potential with each other. So suppose that this potential is a type of function. So it turns out, actually, effectively, you can treat, for our conditions, you can treat this interaction potential as a type function. So what will happen in this case? So if you have, I mean, so basically, you know, for two particles, you can always go in the center of mass frame, so it becomes like one particle, right? The relative motion is one particle, and uh, suppose that the interaction potential between this, uh, these two particles is just a delta function. So what's the feature? So in one dimension, if you have this delta function potential, so what will this uh, kind of system has, have? So it's V, so V. So what's the spectrum of this kind of system? So it's a quantum mechanics. So that's actually something that you have to know in life beyond quantum optics. So what's the spectrum? So what kind of states are allowed in this potential? So it can be some continuum, right? So if you, you know, if you particle is a high energy, right? There are some continuum states. Okay. There is a bunch of continuum states. And there are some bound states. Mm -hmm. 
that from to right is just decay. Yeah. Yes, you saw it. As a matter of fact, there is one bound state. Yeah. Right? There is one bound state. And for this bound state, uh, how does the wave function look like? Exponential decay. Exactly. So this, is, this, is, this, is, this wave function, so that I put it from color. So this wave function will actually, if I draw it here, will look like exponential decay, right? Because basically here and here, exponents, the so the exponents and sines and cosines will show up. Right? So that, that this wave function will have this kind of cast-like -like behavior. And so, uh, and in fact, this is precisely the kind of behavior which we, uh, which we're starting to observe here. So, it, it, in fact, it turns out that in this case, the dynamics is dominated by these two photon bound states. So, essentially, what happens is that uh, basically when you start uh, this kind of you know propagation. So, basically, you start with the coherent field where these you know two photons can be distributed, kind of random distances from each other, and basically this kind of propagation corresponds to a kind of projection of this initial wave function, flat wave function, into both bound state and the continuum state. But these two bound and continuum uh, and scattering states they have different phases, and so basically then as the system evolves, what emerges is something like this. So basically this two photon, the flat, initial flat probability amplitude, gets kind of eaten up here on the side. So on the sides here is below humidity. But right here, it goes up in the center, and it has this kind of cusp-like behavior, like for this, for, for, for this bound state. So basically, what we see here is that really this kind of bound states start to dominate um, dynamics. Does this make sense? Are there any questions? So should I check how awake you are to ask you a question? So, uh, okay, let me do it. I think we sort of, we learned enough to start thinking about subtle things. What you could maybe now ask, or what could one ask is, wait a second. So you are claiming that you have basically created this kind of two photon bound states, which are, which are kind of like two photon solitons, essentially, right? So what we do, we excite non-deterministically, but we excite this and observe these two photon solitons. The two photons which are bound together and propagate together and come out together, right? But uh, so what should be this G2 for the two photon states? So if we take n equals 2, right, in this state, uh, there is not a lot of fluctuations, right, the fluctua no, fluctuations in n equals 2 are reduced compared to a Poissonian statistics. In fact, you can easily calculate what G2 of 0 will be for this 2 photon state. And uh, does anyone know what it is? 1 half, 1 half. So it's actually less than 1. And I am now claiming here, or I'm kind of interpreting these things, is this 2 photon solitons, which result in the punchy. How can this be? Any thoughts? So everyone now can speak up, even the senior uh, lecturers who are waiting to go to have a beer, but now we have to resolve it right before we, before we can relax. Mm -hmm. So what is happening? So why is it, so how can these two things be consistent? This is actually, so any, any ideas? not enough to only consider n equals 2, but you have to like consider the uh, expansion of, of zeros once and then... Exactly, 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 that's exactly the point. So basically, so when I created single photons, I had, you know, the situations where sometimes I had one, sometimes I had one, but never two, right? So, but now I have this situation where I send 
these photons, you know, let's think about kind of a pulse case, you know, and then what will happen is that, you know, sometimes uh, there will be vacuum coming out, right? Uh, or sometimes, uh, sometimes maybe there are ones, you know, or sometimes there are kind of photon pairs. And what I'm saying here is that somehow I try to preferentially create photon pairs, right? So one could think about this kind of state as approximately <coughs> a state like this, which will basically have a vacuum, plus with some probability uh, the photon pair. So what will be the G2 for this kind of state? Right? The G2 for this kind of state is something that you can calculate easily. So in fact, uh, what will happen is that in the numerator, uh, so these two operators will just annihilate this, this pair of photons. So in the numerator, I'll have something like eta squared. And then in the denominator, I will have eta to the of power. Okay. So basically, if eta is small, this g2 will actually go to infinity. And the reason is actually quite simple. So now I have actually enhanced fluctuations compared to the coherent state. So now the while is 0 or 2. Right? So I have basically fluctuations, additional fluctuations compared to the Poissonian case. And this precisely is exactly what is the reason why this G, G2 is enhanced here. So the, for in fact, you know, the more you bunch, the higher will be G2. There is no limit. It can, G2 can basically go to infinity in principle. OK, so uh, I don't know, I think maybe I should really wrap up slowly, but so uh, one uh, last thing, just kind of mentioned briefly, so one could, of course, ask the question.